Hey, good morning, everyone. Let's stand, let's get on our feet. How you doing today? You doing well? If you are joining us online, we want to welcome you here to UCC. We're going to be doing things in a little bit different order today, so bear with us as we continue forward. Today, we're in our last week of our Love Your Neighbor series. We're super excited for these last challenges, these last weeks, and how, what God has to work in our lives during this time. If you are joining us online here in a bit after the sermon, actually, we'll have a time of communion where we're joining together in every service, in every location, in every home, all at once to be able to take this act of unity, this act of communion, this remembrance and act of thanksgiving together. So if you gather whatever you have in your household uh, that can represent bread and juice or the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we want you to be able to participate with us during that time. If you're our first time guest with us here, welcome. We're so glad you're here to UCC. We love to celebrate, to worship, to have fun. We also like to remember and give thanks every week. And so we hope that you find that during the service that you find the hope of Jesus Christ in this time. For now, let's stay standing and let's continue to worship together. Sing this together. You're seated on the throne of mercy. Your glory shining bright for all to see. Oh God, I will praise you. Magnificent with grace unending. You rescue us with a love that never fails. Oh God, I will praise you. Who is like the Lord, strong in battle? Who is like the Lord, mighty to save?
Let's rest in our God's peace today to still our hearts, still our minds, and still our souls to hear what he has for us this morning. Be still and know that the Lord is in control. Be still, my soul. Stand and watch as giants fall. I won't be afraid, for you are here. You silence all my fear. I won't be afraid, you don't let go. Be still, my heart.
Please have a seat. As a dad raising three little girls years ago, there was something that happened on a regular basis. It was little tea parties and plastic food and plastic donuts that'd be brought to me. And I remember as they would smile so big, just little, and now they're all grown, but they'd hand me a cup and have a drink, Daddy. And I'd take it, and their just smile would beam. They'd say, Daddy, have a bite. And I'd take their little plastic donut and dip it in pretend tea. And and then they'd, what would cause me to look at that and go, mmm. (laughs) It was just the relationship of a love for a dad, for his daughter. They, they didn't have really anything I needed outside of the relationship. See, when we come to a time of offering, maybe we don't realize how little we're in control and how little we have. And what he really wants is just our heart. See, we come with our plastic donuts. We, maybe they're just plastic cards instead of donuts. And say, here you go, God. I I, want to give you something. And and he goes, hmm, I'll take a little and smile and look upon. And if not careful, I think we look at God as with a ledger going, okay, how much did she give? Hmm. How much did he give? Hmm. Oh, this one, he did a little better. And oh, she, she skipped three weeks in a row. And. You know, the Bible actually tells a story of of how God might see what we bring. It's it's not as much the amount we bring as in the heart that we bring it. It tells a story of uh, all the wealthy dropping their gifts in and with little sacrifice because they had plenty. And, And then of a widow dropping some of the last that she had and God's like, that one is what made him smile. So let me ask you, what heart do you give? Do you you come in this thing called offering and just say, here, here's what I have. Maybe it's just the equivalent of a plastic donut, but you say, God, here I wanna give. You know, there's several ways in which you can give. You can give through the app or on the website. You can do through uh, cash in person or through check. And you can mail that and you can drop it by the office. You can even text to give if you'd like. But know that at the end of the day, God's given us everything we have. And we bring our plastic donuts, but it's because of love for a good God who's given us everything. Let's take a moment and watch this missions moment. The way we express the love of Jesus Christ and the passion that he had is that we go out there and we serve others. We go to the out of bound places, the ends of the earth. The world is changing, but the gospel doesn't change. The message of the cross doesn't change. We're gonna make every effort to share the gospel. The world has been decimated by COVID-19, but the work here at Samaritan's Purse, it never stops. No greater need and no greater time than right now for us to go out and serve boldly in the name of Jesus Christ. And we do it through Operation Christmas Shop. It's a platform that God has given Samaritan's Purse to share the gospel more than 10 million times every year. Jesus loves you. The wonderment of it is that the child's encounter is not with material things. By faith, the encounter is with things unseen, and they're receiving that for the very first time. From the shoebox to the greatest journey, this is the Great Commission. During this pandemic, during all the fear that COVID-19 has brought to the world, this is when we go out and share the truth. Jesus said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have a job to do. 
This is what these shoe boxes are all about, is going out in the heart of this darkness, the heart of this fires, to go out and bring of hope of Jesus Christ around the world. Is there a sense of urgency? Yes, there is. Because there's kids out there without the knowledge and the hope of Jesus Christ. Get out there to be a part of this. Right now, it's the time. Operation Christmas Child Collection Week is November 15th through the 23rd. We will have a contactless drop-off. For more information on how to pack a box, you can go to the Samaritan Purse website, samaritanspurse.org slash OCC, or click the QR code on the screen and get a direct link with how to pack a box and what to include. We look forward to being able to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ this Christmas season with your help. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? Would you be mine? Would you be my neighbor? Hey guys, it's the last week of our neighboring series, and I'm so glad that you've been with us. You know, as we have used a fun kind of silly theme of Mr. Rogers, he is actually uh, just a, a platform for us to jump into the greatest commandment, which is uh, what God gave us the in this incredible story of Jesus being asked what matters most, and it's to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all that you have. And to love your neighbor as yourself, that all the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. You know, if not careful, we miss the basis of what we're about as we grab here and we grab here and we focus here and we go there. And it's so easy to get distracted in this world. You know, if there was ever a time that it was easy to get distracted, it'd be right now in the midst of 2020, in the midst of COVID, in the midst of an election and all that is going on. But, but the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ, if it was ever needed, it is today. And so I want to say thank you for joining with us online. For those who are here in person, I want to ask that you would engage in this time and, and just try and quiet some of the noise for just a moment. Let's quiet some of the ads. Let's quiet some of the fear and just say, God, would you speak to us? You know, he gave us an incredible message in Luke chapter 15. If you'd like to open your device on your, and get your Bible app out, whether it's get out your physical one, following along on the screen as well as easy. But I want to ask you as we go through this incredible little account, as Jesus tells us three different stories, and we're going to focus in on one, let me just ask a simple question as we begin. Why does God leave us on earth after our eternity is sealed in heaven? And once you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you say, I am a sinner and I need grace, I need forgiveness, I need your love, God, why wouldn't he just go, okay, take that one out, put them into heaven? Because this world is a messy place. It's filled with disease and sickness and division and wars and, and all kinds of pain in many ways. Yes, there's good here too, but there's all this back and forth, and heaven is going to be awesome. You know, really, for me, as I read the Word of God, the answer to that is just comes in, there are two things that you cannot do in heaven. It's going to be perfect, so there's no more sin. And there's not going to be any more lost because everybody has been divided between heaven and hell at that point, so you can't share the gospel. So if you can't sin and you can't share the gospel anymore, which one do you think he leaves you on earth for? 
I hope that you hear the heart of God as we jump in because somebody cared enough about you to at least get you here to be seeking him. And many of you have put your faith and your hope in him. And actually, Jesus is the foundation of your life. And if that be the case, we must join him in the calling that he's given us with one heart. You know, uh, the, the setting in Luke chapter 15 is given to us in the first couple of verses. It says, yes, tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. So real quick, the crowd that would often come, it wasn't just religious. It was some very what would be considered lost, messy, sinful people of that time. And then verse 2, it says, this made the Pharisees and the teachers of religion here now start complaining that he would associate with such messy, nasty people. Why don't you tell them to go away? Why don't you just convict them of their sin? Why, 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 why? And then he says, he even ate with them. You know, the implication here is that as the religious teachers were jealous of the crowds that were coming, they basically said the only reason he has a crowd is because he wants a bunch of sinful people there. He just, he, just, he just overlooks it all and lets them come and a bunch of sinners. <laughs> like a Saturday night live skit. But you know, lost people were and are and will continue to be the number one priority of Jesus. And the problem with evangelism as his focus Often we as church people, and definitely those who are just religious people, struggle with that. They don't like it. See, sadly, if we don't realize how much we have in common with the religious leaders of that day, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and those who cast their stones at the early church and at Jesus himself. So Jesus tells a direct story here in Luke chapter 15 and if not careful, we think it's to the prodigal son that we talk to here about. And yet, no, if you look at the context, he's telling the story to the religious leaders, the muttering and grumpy teachers of the law. Now, if not careful, you can think that Jesus is being defensive or defending himself, uh, and he's not. He's just clearly stating the purpose of the church, the body of Christ. You know, let me tell you the story of the prodigal son kind of as a quick summary at the beginning, and then we'll jump into it. There's this young boy, he starts out saying that, that tells dad, I basically wish you were dead so that I could have your inheritance now. I want my money more than I want relationship. And the dad somehow says, okay, you want it? Here you go. Gives him his inheritance. He's like, great. He runs off, he parties, he spends time drinking and prostitutes and all this other stuff, wild living, and then he finally runs out of his wealth because there's a big famine in the land and a big mess. He ends up feeding pigs, and he's at the very bottom of his life. He's at the mess of mess, and somehow, finally, he gets in his head, home wasn't that bad. In fact, home sounds pretty good, and he starts this walk of repentance and shame of heading towards home, hoping that he could just be hired on as a servant and that his dad might just put up with him, so to speak, that way, and at least he'd have some food and a place to lay down at night, and, and yet the incredible thing happens, and dad just kind of explodes with love and grace when he sees him, and let's just pick up the story here because the amazing thing is dad wraps his arms around him and he says, hey guys, go go take the fattened calf and let's have a barbecue and get the, the ring that symbolizes my love and the passion for him and get a robe and put it on him. And the boy has hardly even said, I'm sorry yet, and yet dad is throwing a party. Now it says the older brother was in the fields working. And when he returned home, he, he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants who was going, what's going on? And he said, your brother is back and your father has killed the fatted calf and we're celebrating 
because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and he wouldn't go in. The father came out and begged him and yet he just replied, all these years I've slaved for you. I've never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And all that time you've never given me even one young goat for a feast for my friends. When this son of yours, now let me just stop on that. When this son of yours, he wouldn't even acknowledge that he was a brother, that he was family, that it's just that son of yours comes back after squandering your money with prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fatted calf. Man, he's just so ticked off that his lost brother they were fearful he was dead, basically. He's ticked off that he came back and then he's welcome home. He was just filled with bitterness and jealousy and anger. And, oh, could I ask you to just ponder with me as I go through the next few minutes of this sermon, do you have the attitude of the older brother or do you have the attitude of the father? I think if we're honest, more often than not, we struggle with being the older brother. Now, following our heart, you know where it leads? It leads to OBD, older brother disease. And you could just look at this and it's that kind of, why why are they getting all the attention? Well, And it's just this high and mighty attitude that you could describe with really just two words we're going to give you today. The first one is that of self-righteousness. Oh, it's just a self-righteous attitude. In fact, do you realize the Bible condemns this sin just about above any other? I mean, Jesus hammers on this sin in his ministry. Self-righteousness is like the one thing he's like, oh, disgusted with and calls out. Verse 29 makes it pretty clear. All these years I've slaved for you, and I didn't get to even have one little party. <laughs> the old brother saying, hey, I'm a pretty good guy. Let me share with you a quote from Bonhoeffer, a pastor from history. It says, anybody who has once been horrified by the dreadfulness of his sin that nailed Jesus to the cross will no longer be horrified by even the rankest sins of a brother. Looking at the cross of Jesus, he knows the human heart. He knows how utterly lost it is in sin and weakness and how it goes astray in the ways of sin. And he also knows that it is accepted in grace and mercy. Friends, we got to be so careful not to slide into the older brother syndrome, slide into the the attitude of the Pharisees. Because once we're accepted and loved, if not careful, we just say, hey, it's about me now. It's about what I want. It's about a church that takes care of me and my family and my favorite, my likes, my wants, my desires. You know, just let me tell you a story out of Luke chapter 18. I'm just going to mention it for a second here that it was about people who felt good. It was, uh, hey, I attend church, I give, and I do this, and I do that. And Jesus tells a story about uh, two people that went to the temple to pray, and one was a Pharisee, kind of went up and was like, oh, Lord, I've done, and I've done, and I'm done. I'm thankful I'm not like them, and Another was just a a sinner who wouldn't even come up close to the altar and just said, I am so broken. Oh, God, have mercy on me as a sinner. And he just ends it by saying, I tell you, the sinner, not the Pharisee, not the religious leader, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. This whole attitude of I'm better is just makes no sense. And yet I'm so easily drawn into it of I'm better, I'm better, and 
I, I know that you are as well when you're honest. See, I need, do you hear me? And you need grace. Grace is what it's about. It's only when we understand our need of, of Jesus' forgiveness and we realize our sin and we turn to an almighty God and say, please forgive me, that any of us find salvation. None of us walk up and he's like, oh, finally, she's here. Oh, come in on, help me straighten out the rest of these people. None of us are like that. See, the, the person who says, I have a clear conscience, I'd say has a really bad memory because all of us need the Father's forgiveness. Uh, if not careful, what will happen is the very people we're trying to reach will begin to alienate because we develop an us versus them mindset where we kind of stand on this side and say, well, I don't act like that, but we still have plenty of sin in our life. We may not sin in the way they sin, but we still sin. We all still need grace. And, and so we can't draw our lines because the very people that need to, to feel welcomed into a church, feel a home so that they can have the Holy Spirit convict them of sin, often get turned away at the door by all our religiosity. That's the older brother side that we have to struggle with. Now, let me just switch gears for just a moment. And if you are here as a prodigal today, could I challenge you to understand the incredible love of a God Almighty who cares about you and wants you? And I'm so sorry at times that we've drawn our walls up and put them up in front and made it hard for you to walk through the door. But I want you to know there were just one sinner talking to another sinner, all in need of grace. So self-righteousness has no place here. You know, the second is that of selfishness. If not careful, we can become so selfish that it's just me, my wants, and... <laughs> We kind of sound like Shrek saying, it's me and my swamp, and uh, uh, we got to let others in, and, and we got to take the fences down. You know, there's a story he tells in this chapter. I encourage you to go read it. It's about a shepherd who has 100 sheep, and 99 are safely there with him. One is lost, and it talks about it. Now the shepherd goes and looks for the one, and it's God the Father going looking for the one that, that we can't leave anyone out there alone, lost. We can't just be satisfied with the ones we have, and because lost is a really bad place to be. You know what? I think all 99 sheep were, were saying at that point, and what we tend to say today is, what about me? And there's just this kind of attitude of blah, 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 blah. And sheep and people think of themselves first. We think about is it, is it the programming that I like? Are the chairs comfortable? Is the temperature the way I, I'm comfortable? Do they have the, the things that I desire on Sunday morning? And we struggle with the same things the Pharisees struggle with. But once you put your hope in Jesus Christ, once you say, okay, I, I, I've received grace and forgiveness, this is an amazing thing. At that point, church, our hearts must align with his heart. See, if we're going to follow Jesus' heart, it will lead to the lost. It, it won't lead to more for me, myself, and I. It's going to lead to the lost. That's where our focus should be. And so we do a couple of simple things, and we must continue to focus in because we'll forget otherwise. First of all, we search for the lost. That's what this whole neighborhood series has been about, is challenging you to reach out to those around you, get to know them, find out their names, begin to pray for them. And we search for the lost. We don't just wait for them to come through the door. You know, Jesus said straight up in Luke chapter 19, he came to seek and save those who were lost. And he told us to go as his church. But I think the church forgets to go. And we say, no, you can come if, if you act like me and you talk like me and you, you come in and kind of get used to it. You clean up yourself a little before you come too, please. And it's so not the biblical picture. You know, a, a researcher, Thomas Vernier, uh, said that 
as he searched around and looked at budgets and ministries, he, he just uh, did some statistician type stuff of came up with 95% of what the church does and how they spend their money and where they put their emphasis is focused inward and not outward around the world. 95%. When the mission is out, we put 95% of our focus in. That must not be. You know, I was so proud of our church family just a couple of days ago as I, as I walked through our upper parking lot because we had it set up for a trunk or treat and, and all these different stations for kids to come during a very difficult time. And, and it was something we had to really think about. Do we do this in the midst of all this pandemic and all that? And we came up with the best ways that we could to make it safe and to keep it in a good place and it's outside because families are hurting right now. Little kids are, are struggling, and all ages are. And so we decided to do this, and it wasn't just about candy or dressing up or having fun. You know, what I was so excited about is that every kid who came through got a gospel track and that, that told the gospel in a language they could understand. And, and we also had a little QR code on for the parents that we gave to them that they could listen to the, the gospel, right? Just listen to us share the three circles and how the story is of our brokenness to our redemption and how God wants to do that in our lives. And, and it, it takes a little bit of trunk or treat and some candy and for an opportunity to reach a soul for Jesus Christ, I, I'm just pretty pumped about that, that, that we care enough. And I'm so thankful for the people as I, I just walked around and I was just going, thank you to each, oh, thank you. And I saw all these people and it was just great. Would you go and have that message because people need it? You know, the second thing that we must do is we must make sure that home is attractive so we attract, and you go, before you get lost in this, it doesn't just mean lights and, and music and coffee or whatever. Hey, if not careful, that stuff could even become a distraction. What we do is we make sure that home is a place that someone wants to go to, right? It ought to be. It's a broken home if you don't have a desire to go home. And, and so what happened with this boy? He's in a ugly, bad place. And when he goes, I, I don't know what to do, and, and my life is a wreck, and home was a place that he wanted to go. It was attractive. He thought of his father. He thought of a safety. He thought of the provision. He thought of maybe I could be hired on even. And, you know, the, everywhere Jesus went, sinners were attracted and they were hung. He got accused of hanging out with sinners all the time. You know, the people he used his harshest words for, it was the church, the religious people, not, not the lost and the broken. He, he just loved them over and over and over again. You know, the woman at the well, Jesus just made her feel loved when everyone else rejected. You, you think of Zacchaeus, everybody couldn't stand him. He's a tax collector. He's a traitor against his own people. And Jesus just said, I love you. I'm coming to your house today. And, and the woman caught in adultery, not, not accused of, but caught in the act of adultery, found love and grace. So to the audience of the older brother, we need to be cautious and make sure that we are something that is attractive to a broken and lost world where they go, that's a safe place to go. That's a safe, they would care about me. They would love me if I went there. Now, if you are on the other side, let me just stop once again and just say, even though this passage is not really directed at the prodigal, if you're a prodigal here today, whether we make it a place where you're feeling welcomed or not, I want you to know that your God has welcomed you with open arms and that he's a God who runs to you and cares about you. See, if you'll just stick around long enough, I know it might feel awkward, it might feel weird, but if you'll just stick around for a while, the Holy Spirit will work in you. And I know there'll be some conviction of sin because all of us have sinned. We've all broken God's heart. But he still says, I love you so much, I send my son to die on a cross for you, and he invites us to come. Let the Holy Spirit work on you. Now, let's jump back in. What did the prodigal son think of when he woke up and realized his mess? It says in verse 17, when he actually came to his senses. That's like a verse we all ought to memorize, isn't it? 
I, 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 and that's the one that just right up. I just really want to come to my sense. And, and I think a lot of us struggle with that. But he finally says to himself, at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. There are so many people who are dying of hunger for something more than what they have right here in this community. And, and I wonder when they think of home, do they think of University Christian Church? Do they, when they think of family, would they see you and go, oh, that, that person would love me and care about me? Or do they maybe think more often, okay, I just need to go back to the bar because they love me there at least. The father pulled out all the stops for this lost child. Before he had proven himself, before he had earned anything, he just came back and said, oh, father. I'm, all he did was just set his heart towards him. And the father's like, let's throw a barbecue. He goes, hey, get the ring, get the robe. We're gonna, my son was dead and is now alive. I was amazed at his response. Why would the father do that? It's because the father knows how bad it is to be lost. And sometimes we, in the midst of grace and love of the father, forget how bad it is of a place when you're in that cesspool of your own selfishness as a prodigal and are just lost. Lost people must be our number one priority because of the consequences Listen to Jesus in verse 7 of our text. It says, in the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents and returns to God than over the 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. And, and so God would say, you know what, it is better than, than all the programs of the church, than over all the worship, over, over all the Sunday school classes, over all the life groups, when just one person, there's more celebration over that one who would return home than everything else. You know, here's the crazy thing. Jesus actually doesn't finish the parable. It's a story that, that comes to a cliff, and you got to decide, which way are you going to turn? See, you go, what do you mean? Well, we don't know whether the older brother, and he doesn't say, well, the older brother joined with the father and went on in and happily ever after. It doesn't say that. And it doesn't say that he steps outside and he's all angry and he's crossing his arms and he's all bitter and angry. Jesus didn't finish the parable because the story is still being told in us today in each believer and just as the father said to his son, oh, dear son, you've always stayed with me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost and now he is found. And so the question is, is how will you respond to the call of Christ? You know, we do something each week and I, that is called communion and I've I wanted to finish today remembering the one thing that unites us. And I'd like to ask if you're at home to grab the elements, some bread, some juice, uh, whatever you have at hand. For those who are here in person, please grab the little cup there. It has a bread on the top. It can be a little hard to open. It should be right on your chair. And, but pull back that clear top copy, uh, or cover. And I, I just want to remind you of something as... We come to this time of communion to remember there's one thing that unites us all. It's the cross of Jesus Christ. It's, uh, if it wasn't for the cross, I'd be lost. You'd be lost. We have young people, we have old people, we have just starting life people, we have people who are retired, and we have military, we have college, we have people who like contemporary, we like people who like traditional, but we have one thing in common, a need of grace. So together, let's take this bread. pull back that second layer the juice represents the blood of Jesus that was shed 
that I might have grace, that you might have grace. So as one body with one heart, drink with me. Bow with me in prayer. Oh, God, I thank you so much for your incredible love and your faithfulness. God, I come before you broken as a, as a sinner who needs grace every day. And, Lord, I don't want to ever develop that attitude of the older brother, and yet I know at times I do. And so, Lord, first of all, I just say thank you for forgiveness. And, Lord, I ask that you would just move in each of us and that you'd help us as a church body to have a heart that, that bleeds as you literally bled for the lost. That we would love them and that we would provide a place where they would feel welcome and cared about and that in the process that your Holy Spirit might move their heart to cry out to you for grace and forgiveness and that they'd experience life. Oh, God, come and have your way within our hearts. We need you. We so desperately need you. Lord, uh, for those who are here today, I know some need to just cry out for forgiveness for their attitude, and others, Lord, need to just cry out and say, Oh, Abba, Father, I've been off in a far land. I've been worthlessly throwing away everything that you've given me and I want to come home. Oh Lord, would they come home today? God, give us a heart that matches yours. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand with us? We're going to go into a final couple of songs here and I, I pray that you would just say, oh, Lord, I love you, and let him move. Sing that with us. Yeah.
people come together, strangers, neighbors, the blood is one. Children of generations of every nation, the kingdom come. So don't let your heart be troubled. I hold your head up high, don't feel no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where hell comes from. Oh. Let's declare this together.
is in his blood. Jesus, the light of heaven, a friend forever, his kingdom come. Let's give thanks and praise to our God, our King. Amen. Before we head out today, we want to share with you what's coming next here in the life of UCC. So let's take a look together at our church news. This past weekend, UCC and MHK Soup Kitchen partnered to provide a drive through food distribution. Volunteers from UCC and the Soup Kitchen joined together to give out 833 boxes of groceries. Each box weighed around 35 pounds each and provided groceries for three meals for a family of four. People were waiting in line for two hours before the food distribution began. In just around two hours, all the food was gone. That's 25,000 pounds of food given to people in our area that need it in two hours time. We got to hear sweet stories of people needing the food for themselves and others that came through the line just to get food for their neighbors and friends. This helps people that can't get out of their homes for a multitude of reasons. It was a blessing to meet those physical needs of those around us. We also had the opportunity to impact people spiritually as well. We gave each card a postcard that had a link to a video about God's powerful story of redemption. In the Bible, we see Jesus time and time again meet physical needs of people, as well as meeting their spiritual needs. This video is available for all of us to use as a tool to share with people that want to know God's story. To access this video, you can go to university.church message. On Sunday, November 15th, UCC will be hosting our annual meeting. At this meeting, we will be talking about what has been going on in UCC and some plans for the future of our church. This will be a short meeting, and if you're a member of UCC, we'd love for you all to attend. Our next sermon series is one to be excited for. It will be about leaving margin in your life. This means room for family, finances, and even friendships. God desires for us to invest in these areas of our lives, even though the world we live in today pushes us to spread ourselves way too thin. Join us next week as we start our new series. Getting connected with UCC is so simple. We have a QR code that can take you to our Connect card, prayer card, and a way to sign up to our weekly email news blasts. You can also like us on Facebook, follow our Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. As always, you can find out more information on our website, university.church. Thank you all for joining us in worship today. I hope you were challenged by this series of how to be more engaged with the people that you actually share space with, the people who are your neighbors, your friends, your family. We hope to see you back again next week as we start our brand new sermon series. Uh, if you are on this lower level, again, please help and participate with us to uh, exit out those back doors. Any of those back doors will do. But if you could leave space between parties so you can social distance as we are exiting, that would be a huge help to all of us. Thank you so much. Balcony, you can exit either doors in the back or on the sides. You're welcome to do either one of those. And if you are joining us online, thank you for joining us today. We always want to connect with you. So let's take a look at this post show together. Thanks for joining us today, church. We want you to know that if you are moved in any way or would like to talk to somebody about next steps in your faith, you can email connections at university.church. If this was your first week back, our neighboring series walked through how Jesus truly wants us to impact those around us. We had magnets that allow you to write in your neighbor's name to remember to pray for them or to be intentional with them. As this series ends, we don't want our efforts to love our neighbors to dwindle. So we encourage you to continue to exercise that love. Have a great week, family.